it is. Mm -hmm. I like, I came out of a toxic relationship. So I also did a lot of research on like borderline personality disorder to understand that like I wasn't truly crazy. Okay. Uh, that, that really helps in the initial stages and journaling. Okay. Like to this day, I journal pretty much every day. It helps you like release all those toxic thoughts that are raging around in your head when you just want to get past drinking. Okay. So did, did your toxic relationship, did that person try to make you believe or did you start to feel you were crazy? Did someone make you think you were borderline or how did that come about that you did research on that? Um, so I legitimately became crazy in that relationship. Okay. <laughs> that, that's what I, that, that's, that, yeah, right. Like, uh, I was obviously accused of being crazy, but then like, I actually did, like, I was questioning everything. Like, is this even real? Like this, just the constant revolving door of like trying to be sober and then not being sober and then wanting to just go get drugs. Like it was just a whole, it was crazy. Yeah. And so when did that relationship start? That relationship that proved to be toxic, when did that start? What year was that that you went through that, that it started? So it initially started in 2012, but like the first year I started my job and then it was good for like three years. Oh. And then we broke up, did the whole break up, get back together thing ah, for okay. way too long. And then after that, like somehow we're like, let's move in together. Like, that's a great idea. Clearly we haven't been succeeding in dating. Let's just dive in and move in together. You need your own, <laughs> you need your own show. It should be called the, it should be called the L factor or it should be called Timbers. I don't know. You should, you should do that. You're funny. You're funny. But anyhow, so, so <laughs> that, that was, that was really cool sarcasm there. That was really, okay. So you decided it would be a great idea. If, if the dating is not working, then we should see each other every day and wake up with each other every day. So you moved in together. <laughs> and? And then, like, it ended up, uh, the addiction just became, like, a habit then because we were both together all the time. So it was, like, it slowly became, like, every Thursday we'd get Coke again and then just binge the whole weekend and try to function as humans, like, I was dying from hangovers like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and trying not to drink. And then like you just give in because your partner's drinking and doing drugs in front of you. And you're like, well, I want to, too. Mm. Or like even like I would instigate and be like, I want to get it. And then like once it's incepted, right, you just both go right. so hard and hard. <laughs> no, all right. Yeah. So now you're you're hard that you went. Then uh, again, for me, I'm saying if somebody's listening and they're in that moment that you've already passed, then what was it like for you? When did you start getting some daylight that you started thinking something needed to, to change or some adjustments needed to be made? When, when did you start getting to that point? Um, I mean, I was constantly being told by him that I was an alcoholic and that I had problems, but I don't know if you know much about borderline personality disorder. Go ahead. Uh, they tell like explosive episodes and then they forget that they happen. Yeah. So like there was a lot of abuse coming from those episodes and then I would be traumatized from that and then I would go drink mm -hmm. and just explode. So then I became toxic as well. And it's like a revolving door of torture. Sorry, what was your question? No, 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 <laughs> no. Nope. The question is unimportant because I'm taking the journey. So this revolving door of torture, now it started around 2012, you said three years. And so from 2012, and we're talking 2020 now, where in that span of eight years did all of a sudden, to you, you went like, okay, I'm off of this roller coaster. I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. So it didn't become a real issue until like 2017, 2018, when uh, Coke was introduced. And that like, I had avoided it until then, because he was doing it before then, but it was never, I just never got involved. And then 2017, 2018, like, I ended up moving and like, I didn't really have a sense of community or like have friends to right, right. hang out. With. But that could have been like, 
on my own part. And I just ended up hanging out with him and then kind of taking on his lifestyle. Right, right. When it started, to, like, I started to get the cravings and then, like, our relationship still wasn't that good. And then we moved in together, um, like, May of 2018. Now, when you when you say, when you say uh, as I, uh, I, I try to gently interrupt you here, you say that you had cravings, just to back up for a minute, the cravings for the cocaine, the cravings for the alcohol, the cravings for him, the cravings for the life. What do you mean by when you say the cravings? Good question, because it probably was all of the above. Definitely the cravings for his attention, because we weren't, oh, before we moved into okay. we weren't, uh, like, in a committed relationship. So it was like, it was attention-seeking for him, and that, like, and then with that came the alcohol and drugs. So, so because that's getting his attention was was the predominant thing, because that, that's, that's normal. That, that happens, because you guys are in a relationship. But he brought all these other things with him that proved to be toxic is what you're, you're saying that it was, yeah. it was a whole package. That went on. Yeah. Yeah. So May, you said May of 2018 or 17, you were just saying. May of 2018 is when we moved in together. Okay. And I don't know if I moved in with him thinking that it would solve the problem. I don't know. I needed a place to live basically. And so did he. And that's how it ended up happening because yeah. rent's ridiculously expensive. So then I don't know if I thought it was going to get better, but it just like progressively got so bad. Yeah. And by like June 2019, it was like at its peak where it was like the cops were being called. We were fighting, like we were physically hitting each other. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 now when this was going on, I'm just curious to ask, you just mentioned as far as support or community of support, you still didn't have a community to support then, no family, no 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 truthful and honest friends that were there for you, no? Well, the thing is, is I was also hiding the fact that I had the addiction, right? Okay, yeah. Like, did my, my job did get involved and like I was missing a lot of work, so I was put on contract, but they don't, like they did provide counseling, I just didn't take it. Like counseling is free with our job and I did see a counselor, but um, it's like, you can't go to counseling if you're not ready to fix yourself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I was lying to counselor and I was like, well, this isn't doing me any good. Like I'm just, I, I see it now that I was just ignoring the whole thing. Yeah. And then in your, in your ignoring, when you're ignoring the whole thing, did you, did you see that he was also doing the same thing or he was making it worse? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, that was constantly our fight. Like, he would have those explosive outbursts and then say, like, m really mean, hurtful things and then come back, like, whatever, 20 minutes later and be like, I don't remember what I said. And he's like, you can't take those things seriously. And I'm like, but those are very, like, you can't even, you have to think those things to say those things. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> They're in your head or in your heart to, as a guy or a woman to say it to another person. And it sticks in it and it hurts. I, yeah. And it's like things you couldn't even think people could think of come out and you're like, wow. Like, and then it just like slowly beats you down or not even slowly aggressively, I guess, because it was under a year's time. And then like the fight or flight mode comes in and like, I just ended up fighting back. I was sick of just sitting there listening to it. So then I would lash out. Especially like, especially after drinking. I mean, I wouldn't lash out if I was sober, but right. drinking wasn't even an everyday thing either. It was just binge drinking when I did drink. Mm -hmm. When you, when you, when you binge drink, when you were binge drinking, excuse me, when you were binge drinking, you did it by yourself or other people? Was it, was it easier for you to do it by yourself? Did you find yourself in a pattern? What pattern was there that someone else can learn from? if they're going down that same path when it came to binge drinking? The pattern became um, like not wanting to drink Monday, Tuesday, because you're dying from a, a hangover. Okay. And then by Wednesday, like um, I need another drink basically. So then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Sunday, you're drinking basically the whole time or maybe take Thursday off, but then Thursday would be the day that we go get Coke and then, 
like stay high pretty much all weekend. So much money too. Wow. wow. I would say, yeah, take notice of like, because when you drink that much, you don't have any other habits, right? Oh, wait, no, so hold on. Wait a minute. That's a really good point. Actually, it's a really good point you just said. Okay, so explain that first. So, so somebody is listening and they're caught up in this or they're, they have a mate or a partner that's doing it. What do you mean by that when you say that? They have no, you have no other habits. Well, you have so much time, but when you're drinking, like every, everything comes down to drinking, right? You're like, oh, it's been a good day. I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to drink. Yeah. It's been a bad day. I'm going to drink. Like, oh, someone got married. I'm going to drink. So everything becomes drinking because that's how you celebrate instead and then you lose so much time just spending time drinking like you go out to eat and you're drinking and then you spend night drinking you may be staying up till one or two in the morning but like for me i wasn't remembering what i was doing anyways i'd be drunk texting people and then wake up with like severe regret being like what did i even say <laughs> oh my goodness right Ew. but once you stop drinking you realize how much time it takes to drink like you don't realize how much freedom you have when you're not dependent on that addiction like i get so much more done like i have picked up so many hobbies in my sobriety because i have so much time <laughs> like, yeah. and you well it's it's not you have a lot of conscious time right you actually know that you're putting your choices into effect you actually know what you're doing so if somebody's going through that they should be aware that there's they don't have any other habits. They're losing money like mad. But how was your yeah. how was your self esteem through this through this period, especially as it escalated? Describe that for someone who's going through that. What is your what was your self esteem like? Um, I couldn't even look in the mirror, really, to be honest. Unless I was drunk and high on coke, and then like I'd get all dressed up and like feel on top of the world because that's what coke does. Okay. But um if i was hung over like i wouldn't even look in the mirror like i was 30 pounds heavier than i am now and like just horrible like didn't even want to see my shadow basically like the heaviest i'd ever been didn't fit into any of my clothes like oh it was the worst yeah. and and, <laughs> and and no siblings no family nearby to talk to or anything like that um, not that I was comfortable sharing with, right? Because then I'd have to admit I had the problem and I wanted to just blame it all on him. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. One. But like now I know that we were feeding off of each other and like I was clearly just using that as an excuse. Like the only person I'm responsible for is me. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. And that's that that now is how you're living your life now. And the benefits of you living your life of taking care of you, I know Callie really appreciates that. <laughs> right? Callie, your dog, yeah. loves that because um, he has a, what do you, I think you have it on your page. You, he has a sober sober mom. What do you, Golden Retriever mom, I think you put on there or something like that? You, you, uh, sober dog mom. No, so that's what it is. <laughs> So that is like, you need a shirt. You need to make a shirt. You need to market that and sell it for $29.99. You, you should and start a whole new community of people that join you on that. That is really. Is it not? Huh? Someone's probably. There's sober shirts for everything. Uh, that is, is a sober, but there's no, there's no Timbers so, sober shirt. That's different though. That's different. There's gotta be, <laughs> there's gotta be L Timbers sober shirt that, you know, your, your name alone sounds like your corporation, L Timbers. That just sounds like it's a whole huge corporation <laughs> and somewhere in New, New York or in Britain somewhere, L Timbers corporation. <laughs> and everything like, what, is, what do they do? And, you know, you can make yourself this huge company. Um, I told you I was, I was going to torture you. And so I'm getting to that point where, where it, the torture will begin. Uh, but um, it, it, involves, it involves your page. So, so um, we're going to do something that's similar to games that I've played before. But hopefully you're not looking at your page because this involves you not looking at your page. So I get to, I get to uh, ask you on this sober journey that you have, I get to pick out certain things that I find interesting about you in this journey of sobriety because, you know, the sober, the, being sober 
has become almost this huge business. But I, well, your page stuck out to me because you are a thousand percent real and authentic about uh, your postings and, and what you're going through. So uh, let's see here. Question. What did you fear most becoming sober? Yeah. <laughs> are you asking? I'm Are asking, you asking me that? Yes, I'm asking you that. Oh, geez. It was definitely like my inner voice, like my inner monologue, like okay. having to face all of the damage I had done um, to my ex and like to my family members even. Like I had had a huge uh, explosion at my cousin's wedding and like I don't even know to this day what I actually did. Uh, just ended up like blacking out and exploding. Like I, I drank like a 26 or the day of, like it was ridiculous. I didn't need anything. I don't even know if I drank water. So like facing that was a huge thing. And then like even facing, like knowing that the cops were called because of me and yeah, it was a lot of reflection. Yeah. Like I, like I said, like look in the mirror and that being sober, I had to. And, and uh, when you decided to, to go down this journey and, and being sober, um, now you're, you're posting January 2nd as the date that the journey began. Why that date? Um, I would like to say there was like a, a turning point, but I don't know if you saw that one post that I posted like October 20th, mm -hmm. 2000. 19 like I wrote myself a note while I was drunk being like I don't want to be this person anymore mm -hmm. and I think like that incepted the idea like I was just sick of being sick and tired like everyone says like mm -hmm. constantly trying to fight to remember or like yeah. um so December 25th like Christmas I ended up I woke up uh 20, 2019 right yeah okay so I was living with my sister at the time and then uh, we spent Christmas morning together and then I came to my parents' house and I was all alone and I was trying to quit smoking. So I was like, I'm like, this is going to be my last day to smoke. And uh, someone from my past had reached out and they're like, wow, that's really good. Like, congratulations. Like, I'm proud of you. And I was like, hmm, you're proud of me. And like, that really <laughs> resonated with like pride. And then I like kind of lingered on her more than I was am even aware of really because it gave me the support yeah. just even hearing like someone is proud of you and it like after the last year I just had and I was like wow that that really resonated with me and then like um January 1st like I still had some alcohol left over and I was like trying not to smoke mm. and just craving cigarettes and I was like fuck Oh, sorry. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> I told you I have virgin ears. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I, I want to quit smoking. I have to quit drinking. Ah, okay. So that's how it started because I didn't, like, I never wanted to be a smoker. I grew up, my parents were smoking. It's always disgusted me. And I, like, I just became this person that I never wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And, like, I wanted to be able to look in the mirror again. Yeah. 